Wednesday morning, and this is Let's Chat with Kathleen Dillahunt. It's wonderful to see you all today, and I'm so excited just to be sharing with you today with what God has been showing me as I've looked at one of the questions that we've been asked. But let's just open and pray, and then we will chat. Father, I want to thank you for this amazing day. I want to thank you for the privilege of being able to come before you, to come and serve you, to come and love you, to come and share your heart the best that I can by the leading of the Holy Spirit with the people that are so hungry to know more about you and to learn more about you. I pray for such an anointing this morning. I want to thank you that I will not speak the utterance of my own heart or my own ideas, but that your spirit will speak, your word will speak, and that people will be have a revelation of your kindness, your glory, your beauty, and your love for your people. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, it's wonderful to be with you. The question that we've had for this week was this. The Bible says in Matthew 18, verse 17, If he refuses to listen to them, go to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Um, and some Bibles say an unbeliever or a tax collector. Well, if you read that passage of scripture, good morning, I can see people have, have logged in. It's lovely to see you, Debs. If you read that passage of scripture on its own, friends, we may get the impression that God is saying, if people will not listen to the church, kick them out, have nothing to do with them, because they're just pagans, they're just tax collectors, chuck them out. But if we read that in context, and remember, I always say to you, we never, ever, ever build a theology or a doctrine on one verse. We always have to look at what the Bible says in its theme about the same verse. And so let's have a look at that passage of scripture in context. Now, first of all, the disciples came to Jesus and they wanted to know, it actually starts in Matthew 18, it says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So here they're coming with this whole attitude of, well, who's the greatest? Who's done the best? Who, who do you see to be the VIP among us? And this grieved Jesus' heart because this was definitely not his heart. And then he goes on to talk that whoever becomes like a little child will be greatest. And then he goes on and he says this in verse 12, Matthew 18, verse 12. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wanders away? So he's talking about sheep, that people that belong to him, those that are part of his body. And if he finds it, I tell you the truth. He is happier about the one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. If your brother sins against you. So it is a continuation of the lost sheep. <clears throat> if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. That means the word sin is to transgress. That means if he has uh, been mistaken, if he's wandered from the path of righteousness, or if he's violated the word of God, or if he has offended you. Some manuscripts of the original manuscript actually just said, if your brother sins, it didn't say against you. Some later added against you. So it's saying, if your brother sins, Go and show him his fault. If he's wandered away from the truth, if he's wandered away from the path of righteousness, if he's violating the word of God, if he's offended or offensive, and if he's been mistaken, go to him on your own. And friends, the key to going to somebody that has wandered away, that lost sheep, is to go with love and concern that says, I care deeply about you. And I'm really concerned that your choice making at the moment is causing you to wander away from that which is the will of God. But if he will not listen to you, take one or two others along so that the matter may be established by the witness or testimony of two and three witnesses. Everything that God does has to be established. It's not just one person's opinion. It's the opinion of a group of people that all have the same faith, the same understanding, the same love, the same knowledge. That means 
Go and bring him into the light. Show him where he's operating in darkness. Correct him. Lead him in conviction. And friends, conviction is never condemnation. Conviction is, you know what, babe, this is wrong. What you're doing is wrong. But if you just do that, you're going to make it right. And we just want to encourage you to make the right choices. So we're talking about where somebody has wandered off the truth, friends, where they've got involved with the wrong friends, where they are starting to behave back like the world is behaving, or where they're getting caught up in Eastern philosophies, or they're getting caught up in the ways of Eastern philosophies, and they are being drawn out of the kingdom of God. And you can see it's happening. It's the beginning stages, and you're concerned about them. Go to them in love. If they won't listen to you, take two, two other people and say, listen, I want you to judge what I'm saying. If I'm wrong, correct me. But be a witness to this and go with them. Three of you, you and two others, go speak to them again. Then it goes on to say, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. That word church is the ecclesia, the gathered children of God. Now, that does not mean, friends, that we go to the church and we say, church, this man is in sin. We must have nothing to do with him. It means we go to the church and we say, I'm really concerned. We need to petition heaven on behalf of our brother or our sister because they're wandering off. They've got involved in the wrong relationship. And I'm really concerned about them. If he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Well, before I go any further, and I'm going to carry on reading, let's see how Jesus treated the pagans and the tax collectors. So let's look at uh, Matthew 9, and I'm reading to you from verse 9 through to 12. Jesus went on from there, and he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he said, and Matthew got up and followed him. So the first thing I want you to see is Jesus gathered tax collectors, and especially Matthew. Matthew went on to become one of Jesus' 12 disciples. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I, uh, but go and learn what it means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So what did Jesus do, friends, with sinners, pagans, unbelievers, and tax collectors? He went and ate with them. He went and sat with them. He went and discipled them. He went and imparted to them. He went to tell them the ways of God. He didn't reject them. He didn't cast them out. He went and loved on them. And we see exactly the same thing happening in Luke 19, verse 5, when he sees Zacchaeus up the tree. And he looks up and he says, Zacchaeus, a tax collector. In fact, it was said of Zacchaeus, he was the chief tax collector. And Jesus said, Zacchaeus, tonight I'm having a meal with you. So friends, if your brother, your sister, somebody you really love, the lost sheep, does not want to listen to you, God says your responsibility is to be Jesus to them. Your responsibility is to go, to reach them, invite them for a meal. You've spoken to them. You've had a witness speak to them. You've had the church speak to them. Invite them for a meal. Show them love. Show them fellowship. You know, so often people move out of the will of God and they backslide because they get involved with the wrong crowd because they're not finding the love and the fellowship that they need in the church, friends. And they end up looking for a community and they get caught up in the wrong community. God is saying, be community to them. Be Jesus to them. Go and love on them. That is what he wants you to do. And I'm going to carry on reading to you from the next verse in Matthew 18. Um, and then he goes on to say, if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. In other words, an unbeliever, somebody who doesn't know God. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two or more on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done by your Father who is in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. Well, now he's talking about the incredible gift that we have in the, the power and authority and prayer to be able to bind and to loose. Now, friends, I've heard so many teachings on binding and loosing. And I want to tell you, what is the truth about it? Well, let's see what Jesus says. You see, 
In Luke 4 verse 18, Jesus quotes Isaiah 61. And he says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. And he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. To heal the brokenhearted. Who did he say needs a doctor? The pagans, the unbelievers and the tax collectors. Heal the brokenhearted. Set the captives free. So we loose people from. And to release from prison those that are in, those that are in darkness. So we see Jesus is saying, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord has anointed me to set people free. So when we look at the keys of binding and loosing, we loose them from their sin. What do we bind them to? Good question. Well, God told us that in, in, in Jeremiah 13 verse 11. When he said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, go and buy yourself a white linen girdle. A, 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 which is a belt go and get yourself a belt and the way that you bind that belt around yourself is the way that i bind israel to me so we loose them from their sin friends and we bind them to jesus mark 12 verse 30 says love the lord your god with all your heart your soul your mind and your strength love the lord your god with your imagination your heart god your heart is the wellspring of life with your soul, your feelings, and your emotions, and your will. With your mind, your reasoning, your IQ, and your intellect, and your strength, your physical body. And so God is saying, if you see somebody wandering off and they're going in the wrong direction, first go and talk to them yourself. Out of love, friends, and out of concern. Not out of coming to rebuke them and to challenge them and to say, you sinner. Because that's judgment. And we may not judge anyone. Friends, you are as strong as the next time you fall. If they won't listen to you, then take two witnesses with. People that can come and say, please come with me. I want you to witness this. I want you to be a witness in our communication. I want you to tell me if I'm handling this wrong. And I want you to see if they are handling it wrong. Because we needing to fight for this person's life. And you go once again and you tell them the same thing. And they witness to that, friends. They can then afterwards say to you, Kathy, you know what? You didn't handle that very well. Or they can say, Kathy, you were absolutely right, and we're going to join you in prayer because it's going to be established where two or more come together in prayer. If they won't listen, then you take it to the church, friends, not from judgment, from body of Christ. The Bible says in Romans 12 that we are one body and every member belongs to each other. Friends, you belong to me and I belong to you. We have to hold each other accountable, friends. Have you ever seen a body without two arms? If you see the arms doing the wrong thing, go and encourage them to do the right thing. We belong to each other. And even more now as the times are getting darker, friends, we've got to be there to pray for each other, to love each other, to care about each other. We've got to be there to help each other, to stay in the fold of, the, of God, to keep on being his sheep. God himself will leave the 99 to go and look for the one. How much more aren't we responsible for that? So he's saying, first of all, friends, be family to them be fellowship to them be community to them and second of all pray for them so what i always say to people this is how you pray you know the bible says in, in 2 corinthians 4 verse 4 the god of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbelievers so they cannot see god says treat them like somebody who's blind treat them as if they're blind because they cannot see pray for them father god i want to bring joseph before you and Father, we see that he's blinded and he's been caught up in some direction. And so today we come, two or three witnesses, and we come in agreement on behalf of our precious, precious brother. And Lord, we loose them from the God of this world. And we loose them from the wrong friends. And we loose them from the, the Eastern philosophies that he's getting caught up in. And we loose them from the, the running around to nightclubs and getting drunk and whatever it is, it's all under the God of this world. We loose them from that. And we bind his mind to the mind of Christ. We bind his soul to the soul of Christ, the will of God. We bind his imagination and his thoughts and his heart to the imagination and the heart of Jesus. And we bind his body to Jesus. You know what, friends? I love it when I see in South Africa, you see many of our old traditional black ladies 
would take the children, the little babies, and put them on their back, and they would bind them on their back, and these kids would be incredibly secure while they carried on working and doing everything that they need to do. And that's the picture that I get in my mind. When I bind somebody to Jesus, I bind them to Jesus so tightly that where Jesus goes, they have to go. And friends, that is the key of how we pray for a brother or a sister that's wandered away, friends. We don't disregard them. We don't reject them. We don't cast them out there. We don't say, oh, well, you can just go and wander off and go to hell. Because the father himself says, fight for the lost sheep. Because I'm fighting for that lost sheep. It's so important that we realize this, friends. So now I want to look, you know, it says you never build a theology on one scripture. Jesus speaking. Jesus said what it meant to loose people from. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 19, and he's just said to Peter, Peter, on this rock, I'm going to build my church and I'll give you the keys of heaven. What's bound on earth is bound in heaven and what's loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. It's the key of heaven, friends, to pray for those that can't see for themselves. Get together, two or three of you, and petition heaven on their behalf. That's how we pray. We don't pray long soulish prayers. Oh, God, do this and this and this and this. Oh, God. And we, no, we don't beg God for nothing. We are children of God. We use heaven's keys. Isaiah twenty-two twenty-two talks about heaven's keys. The keys of David were given to Jesus. Jesus says, I'm giving you those keys. So what do we do? We loose them from that which is pulling them into darkness and we bind them to heart soul mind and strength to jesus well two people that were sitting with jesus at that time were the disciples all 12 of them so john the disciple that jesus loved was sitting there and john also wrote a very similar passage of scripture and i'd love to read that to you today about the same topic what do you do when somebody wanders off and I'm reading to you from 1 John 5, verse 16 to 19. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. He listened to Jesus when Jesus said, this is what you do. You pray. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. And I'm not going to talk about those sins today, the sins that lead to death. It, it could be a question for another day. But I'm talking specifically about when you see your brother committing a sin. I am not saying that he should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does lead to death. We know that anyone got born of God does not continue to sin. The one who is born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. We know that we are the children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So John is saying, if you see a brother commit a sin, pray for him. Because children of God do not willfully continue sinning because they've been born of God. So when somebody is sinning, friends, pray for him. That's what John says. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, you approach him first, then you take witnesses, then you go to the church and you pray for them. And you do what Jesus did. Jesus went and had meals with the very pagans, unbelievers, and tax collectors. So go and invite them, create community, let them feel safe and start discipling them again as if they've never heard the truth about the ways of God. That was from 1 John 5, verse 16 to 19. And that was John, the disciple that Jesus loved, that said the same thing that Jesus said. And now I'm going to read to you from James 5, verse 19 and 20. And this is James, the brother of Jesus, also looking at what happens when a brother sins. James 5, verse 19, and it says this. Um, My brother, if one of you should wonder from the truth, and someone should bring him back. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save him from the death and cover over a multitude of sins. My friends, we're living in a time where it says the love of most will go cold. This was such a good question. I think for a long time the church has misinterpreted that passage of scripture because they've taken one verse and they've interpreted what they thought it meant instead of looking at the whole passage and seeing what Jesus's heart was and what his commission was, what we do with somebody that falls away. 
we treat them as if they've never found the truth. Why? Because John says, if you are filled with the Spirit of God, you cannot carry on sinning. Because the Spirit within you doesn't want to offend the Spirit of God. Doesn't want to offend the Father. The Spirit within you wants to please the Father. How do we get deeper into God? If you are wrestling with sin, friends, don't try and use self-control. Self-control has never worked against sin. Just get deeper into God. Spend more time worshiping. Fill yourself up more with the Spirit of God. Spend more time speaking in tongues. Let the Spirit within you get bigger than the voice of the enemy that comes against you. That's the way we do it, friends. And if you see somebody else doing it, you go hold them accountable out of love, friends. You speak the truth in love, but you speak the truth. Rather offend them today. Offend their, their, let them get upset with you today. Then watch them go down the journey of landing in the pit of hell because they've chosen to wander off from the truth of God. And I hope that's been helpful for you, friends. And I just want to end on this. You know, I've been in this area, in the, in the, in the, in the sort of Natal area for the last uh, three and a half years, maybe nearly four years. And I moved from where I'd been living for a long time. And whenever I get invited into a church to go and minister, it's always quite daunting how incredibly welcoming people are and how friendly they are and how they can't get enough of you and everybody wants your attention. But I make a point of visiting a lot of churches, going in without them knowing who I am, because I want to see the state of the church, the heart of the church and what the church is doing, because we are one body friends. We might have little families that get together, but we one body. And I regularly visit churches who don't know me, where I'm not invited in as a guest speaker, where I'm not invited in as a VIP. And, and the truth of the matter is we shouldn't treat each other differently. We should treat each other all the same. And my heart weeps, friends, because I want to tell you this. The body of Christ is incredibly unfriendly. And the body of Christ has no heart for each other. I cannot tell you how devastating it is when week after week after week you go and visit a church you walk in as a stranger and i've been born again a long long time i know jesus i'm so comfortable in my relationship with jesus but what about the stranger that walks in that doesn't know jesus what about the stranger that walks in that's lost what about the the backslider who's been lost for many years and suddenly is drawn back to god because they're a prodigal and they desperately want to come home friends and you walk into a church, and I want to tell you now, I've been in many in the last four years. Nobody greets you. Nobody even acknowledges that you're there. You walk in, you feel awkward, you feel strange, you get dirty looks because you might be taking somebody's chair that you shouldn't be taking. You sit and listen to the service. No one explains what's going on. They definitely let you know you've got a tithe. Oh, yes, every one of them. Everyone will tell you how much you should be giving. And then you leave and you walk out. No one has asked you anything. They haven't welcomed you. They haven't asked if you're new in the area. They haven't asked if you've been there before. They give you funny looks because you're a stranger and they don't know you. But nobody puts their arms out there and says, welcome, welcome. We're so happy that you've chosen to be with us today. My friends, and now we're living in a time where everybody's wearing masks. Now you've got a book to go to church. How disgusting is that? How do people come to the church today when they're prodigals wanting to come back? When they're the unsaved that are, are planning suicide? And they just know that if they could just maybe go to a church, there might be somebody to pray for them. Friends, I want to tell you that we as the body of Christ are doing great harm to the lost. Because we do not care about them. And I want to say to anybody listening today, on to, to when you go to the next church service, will you please do me a favor? Will you look out for the one that's strange? Will you look out for the ones that are not your friends? For the ones that you don't go and hang with every Sunday? For the ones that you don't have your usual little coffees with? Will you go and buy a coffee? Because that's another thing, you've got to go buy your coffee. Where were the days where coffee was handed out just to welcome people to come into the church? Go buy a coffee for a stranger and just say, I haven't seen you before. So what if they say, I've been coming for 20 years? You say, well, I haven't seen you before. I just want to welcome you. I just want to love on you today. I'm so honored that you've chosen to be with us. 
What can I do for you? Can I pray for you? Can I encourage you? Ask God for a prophetic word for them. I want to tell you, friends, my heart weeps when week after week after week, and I often, if I'm not ministering on a Sunday, I go and visit somebody because I want to see the state of the heart of the church because I belong to the body of Christ, friends, and so do you. And we are the salt and the light in this world to reach the lost and to bring them in. And I want to tell you, people are shaken and people don't know which way to turn. And they're going to Jesus and the church to try and find answers. And friends, it's not the responsibility of the worship team and it's not the responsibility of the pastor to meet and greet every single person. It's your responsibility and it's my responsibility as the body of Christ. And I want to encourage you, go and help one stranger feel welcome. Just one. And you could have changed somebody's life and somebody's destiny because many, many times people that are, are planning suicide or people that are deeply depressed will have the last chance of just reaching out to church to see if maybe they can find the answers they're looking for. And friends, they're not looking for a great preach. They're looking for kindness and love and affection and somebody that looks into their eyes and say, say to them, I have seen you and I welcome you and I love you and I care about you. And I'm so happy that your life and my life have connected today. Friends, it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. God is not judging the world and he's definitely not looking for sheep to kick out of the church. There are sins that has to be disciplined with very strictly and we can talk about that on another day. But I'm just talking about the ordinary everyday little things that causes us to wander off instead of staying in the heat of the coals of the fire of God. Let's play our part, friends. Let's be the body of Christ that we need to be for each other. And let the love of Jesus start oozing out of every part of you because they need to see Jesus in your eyes. They need to feel Jesus in your touch. They need to see Jesus in your smile. And they need to know he loves them. God bless you. Until we meet again, I've enjoyed chatting on Let's Chat. Goodbye.